There we go. Good evening. <laughs> so yes, we're at the church and we're we are streaming live, but it's just Pastor and I and two sheep that wander to our door, and we're so happy they're here. We want to welcome everybody watching by Facebook and, and YouTube. Um, today's message is going to be a little, a little different. You know, the Lord gave me this message today as I was sitting at the hospital with my father-in-law and he was getting a treatment and, and I was sitting there thinking about what the Lord wanted me to speak about. And the one thing that the Lord really wants everyone to know is that don't fear. Don't fear. <clears throat> so many of you out there are fearing it, everything is uncertain. Maybe many of you have lost your jobs. <clears throat> many of you right now are uncertain times. Maybe you're sick. Maybe you've caught a cold and you're fearing that you have this virus that's going around. But I'm going to ask you, if you know the Lord Jesus Christ, what really do we have to fear? What do we have to fear? Amen. <clears throat> what do we have to fear? You know, I'm going to read you tomorrow's newspaper, and I want you to pay attention. Really want you to pay attention because this is tomorrow's news, but I have a newspaper in my hand, and I'm going to read you tomorrow's news. Because wouldn't it be nice if we could know every day what was coming tomorrow? That way maybe we can sleep a little better at night. Maybe those panic attacks and those anxiety attacks would cease to exist if we knew exactly. But then you think and you think, what if everything that's coming tomorrow isn't good? But I don't know about you, but when you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I don't know if you were told that everything was going to be fine, everything was going to be good, life was going to be a bowl of cherries. If that's what you were told, they lied to you. And, and we're really here as the shepherds of Almighty God to bring you the truth. And many times the truth hurts because the truth cuts things out of our lives that aren't supposed to be there. So I want to read you tomorrow's news. For those of you who do not know Jesus Christ, for those of you who have refused to bend the knee to Jesus, for those of you who think that you're going to sow your wild oats and then later on in life you'll accept Jesus and, and, and do what you have to do or, or you keep putting it off from Sunday to Sunday. Whatever it might be, whatever reason you have not accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and bowed a knee to him and have asked for forgiveness and repented, as the Bible says to repent, because if we repent, he's faithful to forgive us. But for those of you who refuse to accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, I want to read you tomorrow's paper. And this is not for believers. This is for non-believers, okay? <clears throat> so this is what tomorrow morning's front page reads. Multitudes are missing. Disaster strikes the earth. There's panic and terror worldwide. The police are unable to control the mobs. They're looting. Hundreds of wrecks and drivers because the drivers are missing. Airplanes fall to the ground without a pilot because the pilot was suddenly missing. This is tomorrow's newspaper for those of you who do not believe in Jesus Christ. Because for those of us who have believed and who have faithfully served Jesus Christ, by the time this newspaper is printed, we will be in heaven with our Lord. There's going to be a thing called the rapture. And I know a lot of people don't believe in it. Even a lot of churches don't believe in the rapture. But it's in the Bible. And this is going to happen. And you're going to wake up one morning, you're going to turn on your TV, and they're going to tell you that UFOs, that spaceships came and took millions of people. And, and, and maybe there's even going to be displays in the sky of things that are going to look like spaceships. Don't be fooled. That's not what happened. A thing called the rapture happened and Jesus Christ came for his bride. And the ones who are left behind, the ones who have not bent a knee to Jesus Christ and accepted him as Lord and Savior, you're going to be left here on this earth reading this newspaper. But I want to tell you, you're going to live hell on earth. 
because the times of tribulation are not going to be pretty. And I'm telling you this out of love, out of love for you because I'm concerned for you because we know what tomorrow brings for those who do not believe in Christ. You know, the Bible says that God will not be mocked, that whatever a man sows, so shall he reap. That means whatever you whatever you plant, that's what you're gonna eat. Whatever, however you live, you're gonna eat the consequences of that. And you know what? Whatever's going on now, you know, this panic with the coronavirus and, and, and the shortage of food and the shortage of toilet paper, and you go to the stores and there's a limit, and you gotta stand in line for certain things, and people are losing their jobs. This is just the beginning. The earth has barely begun to go into labor pains. This is just the beginning. But you know, it, it saddens my heart to see what's going on on Facebook. People taking advantage of selling rolls of toilet paper for $5 when families are struggling because they've lost their job or $20 for a bottle of hand sanitizer. Come on, you guys. This is not a time to get greedy and hold everything you can in your hands because you know what, it's gonna disappear. And for those of you who are hoarding food and you don't care if your neighbor's starving to death, you're going to wake up on these mornings and that food's going to be full of maggots and it's not going to be any good for you. Just like the people in the wilderness who try to hide the manna and, and hoard it for tomorrow. But when they woke up in the morning, it was full of maggots. Because that's greed. That's greed. Now I'm going to take you to the Bible and I'm going to give you some scriptures. That's going to back up what I just told you about the tribulation, about, about the rapture. So first, we're going to go to 1 Corinthians 15, verses 51 through 58. I had no idea which way I was going to bring this message because the Lord had gave me certain things to talk about. <clears throat> but as I was worshiping, the Holy Spirit put them in line for me in my mind and told me to open up with this newspaper. Hallelujah. I'm reading from the New King James Version, and it is 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 51 through 58. If you don't have a Bible and you can't afford a Bible, call 505-261-5667 or text me at 505-261-5667, and we'll find a way to get a Bible to you, okay? Because it's really important that these last days that you know the Word of God that you learn the word of God and that you obey the word of God. So in 1 Corinthians 15, it begins, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed in a moment in a twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immorality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption and this mortal has put on immorality, we shall be brought to pass. Then shall be brought to pass the saying which is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Give me a second, I meant to give you another scripture. You know, God is so good. God is so good that these things that are going on, we think that, well, where's God in the midst of all this going on? Where's God? But you know what? God could have destroyed this world long ago, but he's in his grace and his mercy and his love, he's giving us time to repent. Because you know what? None of us are perfect. We have to repent on a daily basis. On a daily basis, we have to repent. Sorry, guys, I lost my scripture. I'm going to finish this one. Okay, let's go to James 4, 8. James 4, 8 says, Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinner, and purify your heart to double-minded. What have we been hearing on TV? Wash your hands, wash your hands, wash your hands, wash your hands, use hand sanitizer. Well, you know what? Us pastors for years, for years, even, even the disciples in the days of Jesus were telling people to cleanse their hands, but it's not to cleanse our hands from physical filth. 
It's to cleanse our hands from spiritual filth. And, it, and to cleanse and to purify our hearts. See, we don't need hand sanitizer to purify our hearts. We need Jesus Christ. That's the only thing that's going to purify our hearts and cleanse our hands. Many of us these days are facing fear of death, anxiety, whatever you want to call it. Many of us are, are fearing that. You know, I've, I've talked to a couple of people who, for a time, you know, what's coming next? What's coming next? I don't know exactly what's coming tomorrow. God knows. But like I was telling you earlier, I know what's coming next for us as Christians, as the ones who've been following Christ, we know. We're here bringing the truth and the word to you because we know what's gonna happen next. You know, the thing is, what breaks our heart and what brings, the only thing that brings fear in our heart is that, you know what, there's still people out there who have not accepted Jesus Christ and they're gonna have to go through a horrible, horrible time. When the rest of us are raptured, to be with Jesus, and I'm not saying that us as Christians are not going to go through anything, okay? Some people think we're not going to go through anything, and we're just going to be raptured, and we're going to escape everything. And then there's some that say that, yes, we're going to go through the first three and a half years. And then there's some that say, well, we're going to go through a little better. Most of us are going to be beheaded. You know what? What matters is today. What is happening today? Today you're alive, and God has given you a chance to repent and to accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Because there's not a lot of days left to do that. I'm telling you with all of my heart, there's not a lot of time. Mm. There's not. There's not time for you to play church. We have to start being the church. Okay? I've heard people who have said, you know, and this, where's God in all of this? If God is full of love, why would he let us go through these things? Hmm. You know, God is full of love. He sent his son to be crucified on the cross to pay a debt and a ransom that you could never pay. You could have lived a thousand years and you could have never been able to pay the ransom that you owed. But he sent his son to pay that. Jesus gave everything at the cross. He gave everything. And I don't know if you can fully grasp your mind around that, but he gave everything. It wasn't nails that held him on the cross. It was the love for you. You're not a pastor, but you know what? You're, you're a pastor's wife. You've lived a hunky-dory life, and it's been easy for you. It hasn't. Trust me. I've been through things in my life that would bring a grown, strong man to his knees, but I'm standing here because I'm standing here on the strength of Jesus, not mine. And these days, I've really been pondering about what's next, Lord. What's next? The battle's going to begin when they come and tell us that we can no longer read our Bibles, that we can no longer have service, that we can no longer mention the name of Jesus then it's going to be a different battle. For now, we're obeying the laws of the land because Romans 13 commands us to obey the laws of the land. And those who disobey the law disobey God. And if you disobey God in any way, you're living in sin. And if you're living in sin, you're going to be separate from God for all eternity. So, I mean, you have to really understand that as pastors, we're here and we're ringing we're sounding the bell. We're ringing the alarm. It's time to wake up. There's no more time to play house. There's no more time to live together in sin and say that God understands because you love each other. You're living in sin. Plain and simple. Stop it. Stop it. It doesn't take much. You don't need a big wedding. Get it right with God. Get it right with God. Go to your pastor, wherever you attend church, and tell the pastor, we've been living in sin, we want to make it right, we want to get married. And then that's the beginning. And then you bow a knee together and you give your life to Jesus Christ, and then you serve him to the best of your ability. That's what, that's what this time is now. This is time that God is showing his grace and mercy, and he's ringing the alarm clock, if you will, and saying it's time to wake up. It's time to wake up. There's no more time to be playing. 
Christian. There's no more time to be playing church. You know, I've had people message me and say, you know, I'm afraid of this virus because they say that it could kill us. Do you know that if you give your life to Jesus Christ, nothing can ever kill you? You'll close your eyes on this earth, but you're going to open your eyes in eternity. Because death doesn't have anything on you. But like I told you earlier, see, we're not going to tell you that come and give your life to Jesus and you're never going to get sick. And this virus isn't going to touch you because you're covered by the blood of Jesus. Yes, we are covered by the blood of Jesus, but we're not exempt from the things that are on this earth because we're on this earth. The Bible doesn't say we're exempt from all this. You know why we cover our blood for our, our bodies? We cover ourselves with the blood of Jesus. It's because that makes us healthy spiritually. Spiritually, it makes us strong and healthy, gives you a strong mind. And it lets you know that when you wake up in the morning, whatever I have to face today, I face it knowing that I'm covered by the blood of the Lamb and that I have the strength and the power of the Holy Spirit in me to overcome anything. Anything. Do you understand that? But I'm not going to tell you that it's going to be easy. Come to church, give your life to Jesus, and everything's going to be just fall into place. It's not. Let me tell you something. Let me read you something. These are the disciples of Jesus Christ. They walked with Jesus. They learned from Jesus. They served Jesus. Yes, when Jesus was crucified, many of them ran and hid. Peter denied him. Judas is the one that betrayed him. And Jesus found himself alone to face the music. How many times have your friends bailed on you and left you alone to face the music? How many times? But Jesus never will. I promise you, because of everything I've gone through in my life, Jesus has been the only faithful friend that I've had. The one who has never lied to me, walked away from me, betrayed me. The only one. But it hasn't been easy. And he didn't promise me it was going to be easy. Believe me, I've searched the Bible to look for a scripture that says that was going to be easy so I can hold God to that scripture because we can hold God to his word. But it's not in there. Peter. Peter was crucified upside down in Rome. James was beheaded in Jerusalem. Andrew was hung on an X-shaped cross for two days before he died. Bartholomew was beaten and flayed and crucified, head down. Philip was crucified. Thomas was burned to death in an oven. The same kind of oven that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego walked into and didn't even come out smelling like smoke. Thomas was burned to death in that oven. But even if people call him Doubting Thomas, he didn't deny Jesus Christ, and he went to that horrible death. <clears throat> Matthew was axed to death. They got an axe and chopped him to pieces, Matthew. And I think because before he became a disciple of Jesus Christ, he was a tax collector. James was clubbed to death. Jude was crucified. Simon was crucified. Judas betrayed Jesus and then committed suicide by hanging himself. Matthias, the apostle that replaced Judas, the name Matthias means a gift of Yahweh. Some studies say that Matthias was crucified and others say that he was stoned to death, but nevertheless, he was killed in a horrible way. John, the one that was called the disciple whom Jesus loved. He was nicknamed the son of thunder by Jesus. John was thrown into a pot of boiling oil. Can you imagine that? Being thrown alive into a pot of boiling oil. But he came out unharmed. Unharmed, why? Because there was still work for him to do. He was given the revelation of Jesus Christ, the last book of the Bible, and then he died a natural death in Ephesus in 98 AD. Every single one of these disciples, except John, died a horrible death. 
They walked with Jesus. They ate with Jesus. They slept with Jesus. They saw firsthand his miracles. They saw Peter walk on the water. They saw Jesus get up and steal the waves of the ocean. They saw it all. But still, life wasn't easy for them. They got the word firsthand from the mouth of God himself. And life still wasn't easy for them. Why do we think it's going to be easy for us? Why are we out there crying, where is God? Well, you know what? Why weren't we crying for God when they were taking the Bibles out of the schools? When they were passing abortion? When they were passing the same-sex laws? How long do we think that we could continue to mock God and the consequences not come and find yeah. us? See, sometimes we don't want Jesus just to take away our sin. We want Jesus to take away the consequences of our sin. And that's mocking God. We can't do that. It's like, I'm going to accept Jesus because I don't want the consequences of what I did yesterday. But that's not the way it goes. That's why many, the Bible says that many will come to him in the last day and say, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not cast out demons? Did we not do miracles in your name? Depart from me. Workers of iniquity, I never knew you. Why? I never knew you. Why? Because you never did it in love. You did it for show. Mm. See, when we do things so that we can puff ourselves up and we can get those little pats on our back and, and you know, we want to get off of the pulpit every Sunday and we want everybody in church to say, that was an awesome message. Pastor, you're awesome. That's pride. We need to check ourselves. We need to check ourselves. Are we serving God for the right reasons? Are we serving Him because we feel in our heart, with all of our heart, to serve Him? Or are we doing it so that we can put it on Facebook and show the whole world what we're doing? Well, we're not even supposed to let our right hand know what the left hand is doing or the left hand know what the right hand is doing. We're not to, you know, there's things sometimes that the Lord calls me to do that my husband doesn't even know, pastor doesn't even know. Because this is between me and Jesus and my reward is in heaven. And I don't need to put it on Facebook. I don't need to let everybody know what God calls me to do sometimes. That's between me and the Lord. You know why? Because when I stand before God someday to be judged, my husband's not going to be beside me to defend me. It's going to be me. We're all going to stand in judgment. One by one. And there's going to be this massive video that's going to be shown of your life. And whether good or bad. And if it's bad, you're going to know that the justice that God has given you is correct. You might even think that it's not enough when you see a picture of what Jesus suffered on that cross and yet all your life you rejected him and denied him. I'm telling you this with all the love that I can muster up because there's no time anymore. There's no time. There's no time to play church now that we can't have services because you can't have more than five people gathered together, I wonder how those people who are used to the lights and the smoke and the ruha and the raha and the cotton candy being thrown from the pulpit, I just wonder if they're being strong enough in these times right now. Was the pastor giving them the true word and the meat that they needed to survive in these times when you can't come to church and see the smoke and the lights? Yeah. Is it enough for you to survive now with what your pastor has given you? Because there's pastors and there's hirelings. You know, sometimes we get messages and not so nice messages that maybe we just bring the, the word forth a little too strong. A little too bold. But it's in love. And let me tell you that the Bible says that God watches over his word to perform it. And right now, there's angels beside me, and they're taking notes of everything that I'm saying concerning God's word. And on the last day, I'm going to be judged by what's coming out of my mouth. So I'm, I'm not going to, I'm not going to throw popsicles from the pulpit so that people can go away feeling good on Sunday morning and go enjoy lunch and forget everything that they learned about the word. I'm not going to do that. See. When we went to Santa Fe. And we were 
fighting against the partial birth abortion. And there was people wearing t-shirts that were saying abortion is health care. And they were there mocking the precious life that God gives. And they were saying that these aren't humans. These are little blobs. These are little whatever they call them. <laughs> Man, if that was one of you, repent. I'm telling you with all of my heart, you're going to go to a place where you'll never forget the day that you wore that t-shirt for all eternity. It will play over and over and over in your mind. And you will see the goodness of God from afar. But it will be too late. It'll be too late now. Today is the day of salvation. Whatever you've done, even if you've had an abortion, even if you had more than one abortion, God can forgive you if you drop to your knees and you ask God for forgiveness and you ask Jesus into your heart with all of your might. And he'll wipe away all that. Because sometimes when we carry things like that in our life, there's not enough soap to wash it away. There's not enough hand sanitizer to, to make you feel good. Jesus is the only thing that's really going to cleanse you from the inside out. See, death had a hold of us. Death had a hold of us since Adam and Eve sinned in the garden. He had a hold of us. And even in the book of Genesis, before God brought the flood upon the earth, he let one righteous man know what he was about to do. And he gave him instructions to build an ark. Mm. That him and his whole family might be saved. But it took no long, long time to build that ark. Okay, there wasn't backhoes, there wasn't cherry pickers, there wasn't chainsaws. Everything he did, he did by hand, him and his sons. They built this massive ark. But the Bible says that Noah was a preacher of righteousness. I'm sure every night after he finished building and after he finished putting a few animals in the cage, he would stand up there and say, repent. Repent. God is going to flood the earth and you're going to perish. Repent. But the Bible says that they were marrying and giving in marriage and just having a good old time. And two by two, and some even... Seven by seven came into the ark and Noah was still preaching, repent. And people were laughing at him. <laughs> the rain? What's rain? And I can only imagine it now, Noah getting in the ark and God's telling him, you know, his, his daughter-in-laws were in there, his sons were in there, his wife was in there, the animals are in there. And, and, and Noah, I can just see Noah standing there at the edge of the door saying, God, just let me one more time. Let me one, give me one more time, Lord. If there's any righteous, Lord, would you do this, Lord? And I can see him standing at the edge of the door saying, repent, please. And I can see people laughing at him. And God tells Noah, get in the ark. And the Bible says that God shut the door. And the Bible says that a door that God shuts, no man can open. And I can only imagine because that door shut and the people are there laughing and all of a sudden, all of a sudden they just started feeling water fall from the sky drops. And it started getting harder and harder and heavier and heavier. And all of a sudden they're thinking, maybe, maybe Noah isn't so crazy after all. Yeah. And it started raining harder and faster and the water started coming up to their ankles and then to their knees and they're knocking on the ark. Noah, let us in. Noah, open the door. Noah, please remember, I'm your neighbor, my kids. Even if you don't let me in, Noah, let my kids. And I can see Noah sitting at the floor at the entrance of the door crying as he got open the door. But God had given them time and space to repent and they didn't repent and God shut the door and the rains came and the floods came and swept them all away and only Noah and his family were saved. 
Today I'm Noah and I'm standing at the door and I'm saying, this is the last call, you guys. God's going to shut the door. The flood of tribulation and famine is coming. The time when we're going to betray one another of, out of fear. But you don't have to fear death. But the Bible says that in, in the day of tribulation, after the Lord raptures his people, men are going to try to commit suicide and they're not going to be able to. They will try to kill themselves and they will not be able to. Because you're going to have to live through the tribulation times. Many things are going to happen and that, that's not even part of my message. But I prayed and I asked the Holy Spirit to just let me just surrender myself to him and to let him speak through my mouth. And I'm, all this is being poured out. It's God telling you, repent. How long are you going to hate that person that you've been hurt, hating for 30 years? How long is it going to take you to forgive that neighbor that hurt you 20 years ago? How long is it going to take you to forgive your ex-husband or your ex-wife? How long? Is it worth it? It's not worth it. God loves you. And he's sounding the trumpet. But the thing we have to remember, you guys, is that we don't have to fear death. We don't have to. Hosea 13, 14 says, Hosea 13, 14 says, I will ransom them from the power of the grave. I will redeem them from death. Oh, death, I, I will be your plagues. Oh, grave, I will be your destruction. Pity is hidden from my eyes. Jesus took every single plague to the cross. I will redeem them from death. I will be your plagues. O oh, grave, I will be your destruction. He destroyed the grave. He destroyed death. He destroyed plagues. He destroyed it. He destroyed it at the cross. He gave us everything at the cross. Do you know why there's plagues today? Because we refuse to repent. We allow women to marry women and men to marry men, and we call it marriage. Let me tell you, it might be a legal contract, but it's not the covenant marriage that God created between a man and a woman, one man and one woman. It's not, and it will never be the same covenant that God created for his people. And even if you're in a same-sex marriage, there's still time to repent. If you're breathing and you're lying, you're watching this, there's still time to repent. There's still time to change from your wicked ways and, and, and fall to your knees and ask God for forgiveness and accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and move on with your life and do better. God is so awesome. You know, today, as I took my father-in-law to his doctor appointment, I could just I could see the fear in the faces of the people, even, even the security guards that were at the door testing the people before they came in. You could see the fear in them. Fear to touch anyone else, fear to get close, just fear. You know, fear, fear of death. But we don't have to. Jesus Christ conquered death when he resurrected back to life. And nobody took his life. He laid it down freely for you, for me. He laid it down freely. See, others who were resurrected throughout the Bible eventually died a second time. You know, 
If you read the Bible on everyone that Jesus brought back to life, the little girl that was sick, the died, that he brought her back to life, Lazarus, everyone that, that he brought back to life, they eventually died again. But Jesus died one time for all sin and for all sinners. He died on that cross. But he resurrected. And he's alive forevermore. He's alive for everything. And he did that so that we wouldn't have to go through an eternity separated from God. He did that out of love. Jesus' resurrection was true and a total defeat of death. As the Holy Son of God, Jesus overcame death once and for all. Peter explained it was possible for death it was impossible for them to keep a hold of him in Acts 2.24. The triumphant risen Christ said, I am the living one. I was dead. And now look, I am alive forevermore. And I hold the keys of death and Hades. That's Revelation 1.18. See, those keys that he holds symbolize authority. Jesus took authority over death, and then he transferred that authority to us. Jesus said, I lay my life down only to take it up again in John 10, 17. The fact that Jesus Christ has conquered death has eternal consequences for us. The good news, the gospel, is grounded in Christ's victory over death. Without the resurrection, there is no gospel indeed. There is no hope for us at all. If Christ had not been raised, your faith is futile, but you, are, you would still be in your sins. That's in 1 Corinthians 15, 17. But Christ is risen, and as fellow conquerors with him, Christians have passed from death to life. Christ has destroyed death and has brought life and immorality and light through the gospel, 2 Timothy 1.10. See, the thing is, the day that I bowed a knee to Jesus Christ and I surrendered my life to him and I gave him my will and I promised that I would serve him, I would be his faithful servant all the days of my life, death can't touch me. Can I get illnesses? Yes. Can those illnesses make me leave this earth? Yes. But death can't touch me because my Redeemer conquered death at the cross. Amen. The fact that Christ conquered death means that believers have also been granted victory over death. We are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Romans 8, 37. Christ is the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. 1 Corinthians 15, 20. Which means that Jesus' resurrection is the first of many. Believers who have fallen asleep will likewise be resurrected because Jesus promises to his followers. He said, because I live, you will also live. In Isaiah 25, 8, it says, He will swallow up death forever, and the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces. The rebuke of his people he will take away from all the earth. For the Lord has spoken. See, we can be laughed at, we can be mocked. The Bible says in the last days there will be scoffers and mockers. They'll make fun of us just like they were making fun of Noah. But God says there's going to come a day where he's going to wipe our tears away from all those things that we suffered for the name of Christ. But God is so faithful. Before I close, I want to tell you a quick story. I'm going to tell you a story about a, a dad and a little boy. There was a father and a son, and they were going just for a Saturday cruise in the convertible. He didn't have the top down, but he had the windows open, and the little boy was in the back seat in his car seat. The little boy was like four or five years old, and, and they're just driving, and all of a sudden the little boy starts screaming, and he says, Dad, Dad, get it away from me. And he's like, what, son? He said, Dad, there's a bee. It's going to sting me. It's going to sting me. Daddy, take it away. There's a bee. And he's like, son, don't panic, son. I'm driving. Don't panic. He's like, Daddy, please, please, Daddy. It's going to sting me. It's right here by me. 
So the dad in desperation reached out his hand and he grabbed the bee and he held his hand shut for a long time and he was driving it. He just held his hand shut. And then a little while after, he pulled over to the side of the road and he opened his hand and the bee began to fly all over the car. And the little boy started shouting again, Daddy, Daddy, the bee, the bee. He said, baby, don't worry. That bee can't hurt you anymore. He said, look, baby. Mm. Look, the stinger is in my hand. That bee can fly around there making a lot of noise, but he can't sting you anymore. I got it, baby. I took the stinger mm. for you. Amen. I took the stinger for you. That's what Jesus Christ did for you. That's what he did for me. He stretched out his hand and he grabbed the stinger of death. And he said, look, I have engraved your name in the palm of my hands. That's how much he loved us. He reached out to death. He stretched out his arms on a cross similar to this one. He stretched out his hands and he said, I took the stinger of death. Satan can go around making a lot of noise, but he can't touch you anymore. He doesn't have the power and authority to do what he would have done if I went to the king and died on that cross for you. 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 58. Behold, I tell you a mystery that we shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and shall be changed for this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immorality so when this corruptible has put on incorruption and this mortal has put on immorality we shall be brought to pass we shall be brought to pass the saying that is written death is swallowed up in victory O oh, death where is your sting O oh, Hades where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. See? There's a lot of noise going on around about the coronavirus and about a lot of other things. But it's just the enemy. It's just the enemy roaming around. He can make a lot of noise. But if you give your life to Jesus Christ, again, I'm not telling you that nothing bad's not going to happen to you. You might even get sick. You might even get this virus. But death does not have a hold on you anymore because the power of the resurrection of Christ, it's real. Don't believe me. Go to your Bible. Read the Bible. In the book of Matthew, it says that when Jesus resurrected, the day that Jesus resurrected from the grave, there was such an earthquake that all the graves were open and the people who were dead in Christ rose again and they went through all Jerusalem testifying of Jesus Christ, letting them know you guys just crucified the Son of God. You guys just crucified the Messiah. But through that crucifixion, you have salvation. The same one that pierced him. The same ones that mocked him and cast lots for his clothes. Those same ones Jesus died for. I'm going to tell you, you will never find a greater love in all of your life than the life of the one who stretched out his hands on that cross and took the sting of death for you and for me. There's no greater love. None at all. Not your husband, not your wife, not your kids, not your mom, not your dad. Nobody. Nobody. And that empty place that you're feeling in your heart right now, that fear that you're feeling in your heart right now, is because that place was created only for Jesus. 
And whatever you're doing and however you're living away from Christ, that's what you're yearning for. That's in the Word of God. That's in the Word of God. And let me tell you that the Word of God, let me, you know what, let me read it to you. I'm going to go to Romans 10. If you have a Bible, go to Romans 10. If you don't have a Bible, you can go back later and check what I'm telling you. Go back to Romans 10. This is one of the first scriptures that I learned after I gave my life to Jesus. You're going to begin in verse 9. It says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, not your pastor, not me, not anybody. The scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. Do you understand that? The Bible says that if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You will be saved. Not maybe, not if. And you're thinking, really? God sees everything, right? So he sees everything that I've done in my life. Well, if I could sit here, if I had six hours, I would give you my testimony. And you would understand, and even pastor's testimony, if God can forgive us from everything that we did. Because you know what? I was Judas. My husband was Judas. You know how many times I betrayed Jesus Christ? You know how many times I rejected him? Because I was Peter. I denied him more than three times. But yet he went to a ditch to tell me that he loved me. He pulled me out of drugs. He pulled me out of alcohol. And he told me that he loved me and he changed my life. Has it been easy? Absolutely not. But he's given me the strength from day to day to fight. And you might be thinking about suicide right now. Stop it. That's a lie from the enemy. Not this virus, not the loss of your job, not the lack of money, not anything will be able to separate you from the love of Christ. Nothing, nothing. You bend the knee to Jesus wherever you are right now and you ask Jesus for forgiveness and you accept them into your heart as Lord and Savior, and you will be saved. And if the Lord comes and raptures us tomorrow, then you're going with us. And if you do that, message us and let us know. And if you need a Bible again, let us know, and we'll get a Bible to you somehow. But we love you. God bless you. I pray that this message has touched you. And once you give your life to Jesus, and once it is able, we're able, Find a Bible-believing church and, and begin to go to church, okay? Hear the word. Find a pastor who can give you the truth. If you don't have a church, we're at 3250 Coors Boulevard on the corner of Coors and Sequoia. And we would love to have you here as soon as they lift up this restriction. Or you can call 505-261-5667. If you just need prayer, call that number. Message us if you need prayer. Everything's kept confidential. So you guys have a good night. God bless you. We love you. And we'll see you on Wednesday, on Sunday. Have a good night.